Okay, um, good afternoon. Um, so um, let's again have a look at um, the truss example, um, which we had um, virtual work example three. So um, I think you should get the idea from, from here. Um, we would like to know what the horizontal deflection is um, at that point under these two forces here. So the first step is to say I want the horizontal force at this point and then you've got two options. You can either apply the horizontal force in that direction there so you can see the virtual force with the bar there um, or you could make the decision to apply the horizontal force in the other direction. So, which would be applying the horizontal force like there, okay? So that would be horizontal force in that direction there, um, therefore putting this member here into tension. So your, your choice of direction is quite important um, because the deflection that you will calculate will be positive in the direction of the force. So if you apply a horizontal force in that direction going from left to right um, at that point because you want to know the horizontal deflection at the joint, um, if you apply it going from left to right, then if you get a positive answer at the end of the virtual work calculations, um, then that tells you that that point has moved in that direction. And if you get a negative answer, it tells you it's moved horizontally in that direction there. So by applying the horizontal force in that direction, if um, if the answer turns out to be negative, then that means that that point has actually moved in that direction because that is in the opposite direction to your force. So that's where the um, that's where this comes from in terms of um, the calculation. So um, let's see what would have happened if we had reversed the horizontal force. So if the horizontal force had been, the virtual force had been applied in that direction there. Um, so that's the virtual force being applied by this guy. So if this guy um, applies a force in that direction there, um, then what happens here? Um, nothing except that this becomes negative and that becomes negative, okay? So that means that these, this member here then goes into compression and this member here goes into compression. So we know from what we talked about before when we talked about the signs um, of um, internal and external virtual work, which I talked about right at the start, was that if the force or the stress is in the same direction as the deflection, then it's positive. So if my rock moved from here to here, then it's positive. And if it moved from here, from here to here, um, then also it's positive in terms of the work done, the virtual work done is positive. Whereas if the force is going in the opposite direction to the rock, um, then the work done is negative. And that later comes out in terms of if the virtual, if the virtual stress um, is in the opposite direction to the real strain, um, then we get a negative sign. So going back to the example here, um, if we had applied that in that direction there, um, then what changes here is that that becomes negative and then that becomes negative. Um, or we could say that becomes compression and that becomes compression, which I'll put in brackets there. Um, and <clears throat> in terms of these forces from that load and that load, um, this one here is be tension, this would be here tension, this would be here tension. Um, this one here would be compression, this one here compression, and that one here compression. Okay. So, um, 
and of course we're ignoring that column because we're talking about the we're talking about um, the horizontal force in this case here. So this one here is the is the virtual stress. Um, so of course um, the the force divided by the area would give you the stress, um, which we're not doing here. Um, and then this one would give you the strain, which would be the real force. And then if you divide that by the area and divide that by E, um, that would give you the real strain. Um, and if the virtual is in the same direction, um, then it's positive. And if it's in the opposite direction, then it's negative. So here, obviously, something times zero is zero, something times zero is zero, something times zero is zero, something times zero is zero here. So it doesn't really matter what's happening with these members three, one, four, and two, because it's all going to be multiplied by something that's zero. So what we end up with is compression um, multiplied by compression. And so a compressive stress multiplied by a compressive strain. Um, and um, that would, of course, turn out to be positive, which is this guy, this guy here. So we've got um, We've got the force, um, well, we've got the stress, that the two stresses or the two ends or the two forces are acting in the same direction. Um, so this guy here would then become positive. Um, this guy here would become positive because compression multiplied by compression would give positive, um, would give a positive answer. So then the sum of that would become um, positive there. So work through the same calculation as before, um, 1 over EA, um, that guy hasn't changed because all of these stresses, all of these real stresses or real forces, um, they've not changed, so that guy doesn't change. That guy would be the horizontal force um, applied in that direction there, and L, of course, is the length of each member. So if you sum that all up, you would get a positive value, okay? And then that value would then become positive, um, and we'll remove that. So positive 0 0.018, and then you'll say to yourself, has this point moved left or has this point moved right? And you will get the answer to that question by remembering which direction you applied the virtual force. So here um, we've applied the virtual force in the right to left direction, and so the it's positive in the right um, to left direction. Okay. So um, when we talk about um, sign conventions, or you're talking about um, the movement of your um, of your point, whether that be in the, in the beam or whether it would be in a truss, um, this is um, this tells you um, how it's worked out. And I'll just say, you know, if you mentally just keep track of these things. Um, then um, particularly when we get onto the beams, um, then just keep a track mentally into which direction you expect it to move. And then you won't get confused by the answer that comes out. And you're not reliant on the sign convention to tell you whether it's moved left to right. You would know before you started the question that that point is um, moving um, in, in the left direction. So to the left. Um, maybe I should cross that out and say um, to, to the left. OK. All right. Um, so that's for you to play with in case you get confused by the convention. So now we come on to example number four. Um, so example number four is this one here. Um, it's the same truss as before. Um, so two trusses are jacked apart with a force of 100 kilonewtons. So we've got 100 kilonewtons being applied um, to the truss. Um, what is the resulting change in separation between the tips of the truss? Um, assume for all members um, the area is 0 0.0008 meters squared and E is 200 GPA. And the length of the members is the same as in the previous example. So um, here we have um, the model. Um, so let me just make sure that the model appears under the camera. 
uh, so I don't think it shows the base, but you can see that the base um, is like is like that. Um, <coughs> so um, first um, first things first is um, first things first is um, that we look at the question, and the question says. What is the resulting change in separation between the tips of the truss? So it's saying we want to calculate um, the horizontal movement as these two move apart. Okay, so that tells you that the virtual force um, has to be applied here. So your decision is quite clear. Um, you stick the virtual force um, up here. And we just pretend that um, the toy or the pig is trying to move it, move it apart. Okay. So um, that would be your virtual force. So we've got the virtual force, um, which um, remember that can be anything. That can be one point one one. It can be, it can be any number that you want. And because whatever number you put in um, will um, cancel out at the end. Um, so it doesn't really matter what um, number we put. So we call that the dummy load. We call that the unit load. Um, we call it the virtual load. So we stick on the one kilonewton there. So um, first step is to work out um, the forces um, in the truss members as a result of this um, virtual um, as a result of this virtual load here. Okay. So once you've got the virtual forces acting in each of the members, um, there will be virtual stresses acting in each of the members as a result of the virtual one kilonewton. Then um, we apply the the real um, the real force, which is the jack force of a hundred kilonewtons, um, to pull that apart um, down here. So we've applied the one hundred kilonewtons to pull it apart, and the virtual force up here does some work as a result of it moving outways as, a, as after the load has been applied. And that would be the external virtual work, um, force times distance. Um, and um, there would be, under the virtual force, there would be virtual, under the virtual force, there would be virtual stresses, intentional compression acting on all of these members here and then when we apply the real 100 kilonewtons to the problem these virtual stresses will be doing some work against the virtual against the real force and if the real force and the virtual so if the real if the virtual stress and the real strains um, are acting in the same direction i.e these members are compression and compression in both um, then positive work has been done Similarly, if it's tension multiplied by tension, then positive work has been done. But if one of the members goes into compression under the virtual force, and the same member goes into tension under the, um, the, the real force or vice versa, then the work done is negative. Okay. So um, let's see how to um, solve this, um, this problem here um, in example number four. So... Um, Let's um, so let's go back to the Dropbox. Um, so I'll just tell you um, that all of the lecture recordings um, have been put into this folder, um, raw lecture recordings. So of course the videos here cannot be of this quality in Canvas because Canvas has some video editing stuff that makes the file size small. Um, so, um, for those of you who are able to, you can watch the full quality. Um, you can watch the full quality video um, laid out um, laid out here. So, going back to the start, right to the compression members. So, everything has been put here in terms of the raw um, lecture recordings. Um, if we now scroll down to here to part five, which is virtual work, and then if we go into the in class question. And now we're on example number four. 
um, Catherine has very kindly um, done um, a video solution um, for this where she talks about how every force um, in every member um, is calculated using method of sections and method of joints. So of course um, some of you won't need that and um, but some of you may like to may like to view that if, if you wanted to. Um, so that's available there if you want to. I've also got my older live scribe solution um, which is also on the YouTube channel. Um, so if you click there um, and you go to these YouTube links, um, you can hear me talk through the solution. Um, but what I'll be showing here is the type solutions by um, John Butterworth. Um, the, um, and um, for a lot of you, um, that, might, um, that might be <coughs> what you're looking for. Um, okay, so... Um, So let's have a look at um, John Butterworth's um, type solution, um, which is here. Um, so he says the two trusses are jacked apart by a force of 100 kilonewtons as applied. Um, what is the resulting change in separation between the tips of the truss? Um, member properties and dimensions are in the same as in the previous example three. So the actual jacking force is 100. And um, and the unit load between the truss tips um, can be applied up here. So um, here is the virtual force, and then here is the real force. Um, now you would know um, maybe from cantilevers or bending moment diagrams. Um, so if if you're applying a force downwards here, then of course these forces flow back to the foundations which would be here and here so that effectively means that if you're applying a horizontal force there um, all of those members here um, will not be carrying any force so if you apply a horizontal force here all of the other members will not be carrying any other forces so we can see that um, when when we set up this table of the of the real and the virtual um, so that would be the real and that would be the virtual um, we can see that um, the forces um, in all of the members so we can see that he's labeled all of the 12 members out here um, starting from yeah sorry about this I can't really see um, so one two three four five six seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. So he's shown all of the 12 members down here and the only members that would be carrying a force would be members three, five, 11, and nine. So we can see these here, um, members three, member five, member nine, um, yeah, member nine and member 11. So in the real system, all of these um, are carrying zero. <coughs> so in the virtual system, um, yes, you can calculate um, the forces of this one kilonewton um, in each of the members if you want to but we know that it's going to be multiplied by zero. So you can calculate the forces in each of the members if you wanted to, um, but you know that um, as a result of the multiplication, it's all going to be zero. So um, you pretty much don't need to waste your time um, in terms of the virtual forces. And you can just concentrate on the member three and member five. And of course, um, due to symmetry, member nine, is the same as member three and member six um, is the same as uh, member, sorry, member five is the same as member 11. So under under the force here, um, so under the force here, 
this member here goes into compression. So I don't know if you can see that, but um, I can see it buckling as I stick my load on. So it clearly goes into compression um, under that under that force. Um, and um, you can see the compression force there. And then to balance on the other side, um, that member, member number five, um, goes into tension. So that is compression. And then that one, because we've chosen to say it as, po as positive for tension, um, it's, um, ten it's, um, it's tension. So it doesn't really matter how you show it. What we're really after is compression multiplied, compression is positive. Tension multiplied by tension is positive. Compression multiplied by tension is negative, and tension multiplied by compression is negative. So in terms of the virtual force, um, we can see that when we apply the virtual force up here using method of sections, method of joints, um, that member here, um, that which you see down there, that one has also gone into compression. Um, so you can see that one has also gone into compression. And then you can see that this member number five um, has gone into tension at, as that point um, moves to that side. So of course that member would be going into tension. Okay. So compression multiplied by compression or um, the virtual or the um, or the compression in the virtual case, which leads to the virtual stresses, does work against the real strains. Um, and then you multiply those together and both are compression, so you get a positive number. Um, both, are, both are tension in this case here and you get a positive number. And then what you can do here and here is just repeat the same thing. So you get double the number, which is um, 7040. Um, remember, of course, you're multiplying the force by the length, and we'll need to divide that by um, EA um, later on. So, um, external virtual work, external virtual work um, must be equal to the internal virtual work. And the external work, virtual work is going to be your virtual force um, multiplied, by the, um, multiplied by the separation. Um, so we're, we're asking um, how far apart um, these points at the end move. So um, the change of in chip in separation. So that would be um, the one kilonewton um, virtually multiplied by um, the delta that we're trying to calculate the real the real delta. So that would be the external virtual work that has been done and the internal virtual work is going to be 1 over EA um, and then the sum of the of the real multiplied by the sum of the virtual um, multiplied by the length. So um, that calculation is all done down here um, and then you get 0 0.044 meters um, further apart um, because um, of course um, we are trying to, um, because, because the virtual force that has been applied um, is in that direction there, pulling, pulling each bit, um, pulling each bit apart. Okay. Um, so, and if it was in the opposite direction, then you would end up with a negative, negative number. So um, you could say to yourself, um, by symmetry, um, obviously by symmetry, um, there is no need, um, you could just have considered half of the system there. So if you were considering half of the system, so there you've got the center line, and then up here you've got um, your, your forces, I'm sorry, your trusses um, down here, going down into the foundation down here. So you could have had your one kilonewton here um, as the virtual force, and then you could have had the 100 um, kilonewtons here as the real force. And of course, everything is the same, except this time you'll just end up with um, half the energy. Um, so the displacement would be half as much. So in terms of tip separation, 
whatever this one deflects to that side there as like drawn like there for example so if it's if there's been a tip if there's been a separation there that's going to be half of the of the delta that we will be reporting because the question asks um, what is the resulting change in separation between the tips of the trusses so you could have done it this way just um, just consider half of it and then remember if you consider half when you want to work out the delta which would be the real separation um, it's going to this uh, what you've done here would just be half so um, and then down here um, he says, um, note that where a member has a zero force in one loading case, there is no need to work out the force in it for the second loading case since their product is obviously zero. So this question here is actually um, quite fast to do. And in the, in the exam, um, it might just take you less than five minutes, if even a shorter time um, to finish that one off. So um, that deals with example number four. Um, in this case here. So let's move on to example number five. Um, it says find the mid-span deflection. So here um, of a simply supported beam. Okay. So find the mid-span deflection um, and the slope um, of the simply supported beam under a uniformly distributed um, under a uniformly distributed load. So we've got a uniformly distributed load um, acting um, acting on, on that and the uniformly distributed load has a magnitude of Q presumably in kilonewtons per meter. Um, it says assume a rectangular cross-section so assume a rectangular cross-section um, which might be looking like that okay um, where the breadth here is half of the height. So if that's B for the breadth and that's the height, then the breadth of the section is half of the height. Um, and the, the beam is made of steel, so that G equals um, 0 0.4E. So we've got the Young's modulus of steel, um, which is 200 times 10 to the 3 newtons per millimeter squared. Um, so you might like to um, commit that to memory it's somewhere about 200 varies between 119 and maybe up to 210 somewhere between those two numbers but that's the ballpark and then g is the shear modulus and it's saying that g is um, the shear modulus for the steel is um, e multiplied by 0 0.4 okay so that would be the shear modulus and it says compare the influence of bending moment and um, shear force on the deflection so what we do here first is that um, we would draw the bending moment diagram. So I'll draw the bending moment diagram of that one there, which would be turning out to be um, turning out to be uh, that. Um, and we could do all our calculations on the bending moment diagram. So we could do the entire calculation on the bending moment diagram. So if we did that, then this one here is the real, um, and then this one here is the virtual. So the virtual is asking for the mid-span deflection. So I would show the virtual as being something like that. Uh, okay. And then for the virtual, um, I'll have my virtual force of one kilonewton there. And then down here, I would have the um, the UDL in terms of Q. Um, and then I would be working out what my deflection is of this system here. Um, so we're going to say that's going to be delta. Okay. So, um, so delta um, times the virtual one kilonewton is, of course, going to be equal to the integral um, over the length of that bending moment diagram multiplied by that bending moment diagram. Okay. And of course, um, the whole thing is going to be divided by E multiplied by I. And I can work out 
I can work out um, that, um, that delta. So um, here, um, now we come to a bit of a dilemma. Okay, so I would assume that you guys can do that and I don't particularly want to do it here. Um, so again, if you go on to here, um, which would be number five, um, Catherine has um, kindly done another video solution of this where she would presumably go through the same calculation. Um, and um, if you prefer my life scribe one, um, that's already on the YouTube, which you can click there and then a, a handwritten solution. So um, I don't want to get in the detail of the maths um, and um, for now, but let's, um, but I, because I want to emphasize another point and the other point is that when we looked at these equations here, um, we talked about the internal virtual work due to bending. Um, we had an internal virtual work um, due to the axial forces. So in this case here for this problem, it's a beam and there's no axial force. So of course that's zero. Um, but what we've done is that we've forgotten um, the shear component. Okay. So um, normally engineers are quite happy to ignore shear deformation. So there's actually, um, but I'll show here um, how we can calculate the shear deformation or the deformation due to shear. So let's put that to one side here. So um, one times delta um, has another component and um, that component would be the integral um, from zero to L divide by one over G A. Okay. And then this time it would be the shear force diagram. So for the real, um, the shear force diagram is gonna look something like that, going all the way down there. And then for the virtual, the shear force diagram is going to look something like that. So we've got another bit that can be calculated. Um, so that multiplied by that, and then again, um, dx. So this bit here is what's known as the deflection due to bending. And then this bit here is the deflection due to shear. So there, there are actually two point two components of the deflection. There's the bending def component, and then there's a shear component. And normally for long span beams, so for long span beams, of slender sections, normally we just ignore the shear component. So normally this shear component or the deflection due to shear is ignored. So when you type into Google, um, deflection of a simply supported beam under a central, deflection of a simply supported beam with a UDL load on at the center, um, and it will give you an equation it would give you the algebraic um, solution of this portion here. All right. And it wouldn't give you the equation for this portion here. And um, that's, norm that's normally because in most circumstances, um, the deflection due to shear is much, much, much smaller than the deflection due to bending. And so it can be ignored. But there are times when the deflection due to shear is important. Um, so if your beam was like that, okay, um, and this time I'll draw the cross section on it. So if the cross section was that, which would be a normally sized beam, then you could say, I'm quite happy to ignore the deflection due to shear. 
and um, I'm quite happy to do all my calculations around the deflection due to bending. But when you've got the same beam, um, and this time here, it's under, it's a much deeper beam. So here we would draw that as a cross section, and then here we would draw that as the cross section. So compared to the length L, um, this is a slender cross section, and so we can safely ignore the deflection due to shear. But when we when our section size becomes very big, so like a deep girder used in bridges, something that's very deep, whether there be shear on it, a lot of shear on it, um, because the section is so small, the deflection due to shear um, is important and cannot be ignored. So we can see why the question has been written this way. It's given you 0 0.5 h um, and it's not told you what h is and it's asking you to understand that at some case, um, that for some particular cases, um, deflections um, due to shear um, do become important. So for here we could say 99% of the deflection is a deflection due to bending and we can calculate the deflection due to shear if we want to, but we're quite happy to ignore it. But in the case of a deep girder, um, a very deep section, um, maybe of dimensions like this relative to the length, um, you really should be calculating the deflection due to shear. Um, so here's a book about modern structural analysis by Professor Ian McLeod. Um, and um, he talks about um, talks about failures, and then he's got some case studies. And as I said, um, so he's got some case studies down here um, about um, real examples of um, things failing. So I think he was talking to me once about an oil rig failure, um, and um, the reason why there was the failure was that the engineer didn't appreciate um, shear. Um, so maybe the engineer was pretty used to um, designing just based on deflection due to bending and for some reason had forgotten to calculate the deflection due to shear um, when it came to this oil rig design. And probably may, it could have been a young engineer and that young engineer could have produced pages and pages and pages of computer printout, maybe 200 pages. And of course, it's not the young engineer's fault, it's the senior engineer's fault um, who checked and who maybe got lost in the calculations and overlooked that the, that the calculations presented had ignored um, the deflection due to shear. So um, there, are many, there are many, many failures um, that, um, that do happen and normally they can be explained um, by the concepts that we are learning um, um, in this course. So another example, um, I remember there was a there was a footbridge in Paris that failed, um, and it failed due to twisting, and so the um, it turned out that the engineer had ignored um, the torsion the, the the fact that the um, I'll sketch it out here. It was a it was a footbridge something like that. Um, so quite a nice design in Paris, and the engineer had ignored the torsional buckling um, that can occur. And there was another example, um, I think it was a pyramid shape, if I remember correctly. And again, the engineer in the design calculations had ignored that there was a torsional mode of buckling of this um, system here. So he was probably considering all the buckling that we've talked about, but he had forgotten that the whole um, that the whole thing was susceptible to twisting, um, or a torsion due to, or a buckling failure due to twist um, from the pyramid. So um, these things don't happen very often, but when they do, they tend to hit the headlines. And when the engineers sit back and um, have a think, um, they often realise actually um, the explanation for the failure can be traced back to a misunderstanding in what they would have learnt in their second year mechanics. Okay, um, so in most cases here, you can ignore deflection due to bending, as I've said, um, but um, bear in mind there would be cases where 
um, the deflection due to shear um, should be included. And uh, of course, if you want to be very careful as a young engineer, um, you might as well just calculate the deflection due to shear. And um, we've shown how to do that, just integrating um, these two um, shear force diagrams. Okay, And you can see the effect would be dependent on the relative dimensions um, compared to the length L. So I wanted to make that point um, <coughs> without doing the calculation. Um, so now we'll have a look at um, Catherine's calcs. Um, so here, um, find the mid-span deflection and slope of the support. So here we've got um, the external, virt we've got the internal virtual work, and we can see that um, we can see this term here is the bending, and this term here is the shear. Um, so here is the real, and then there is the virtual. Um, here you get your bending moment diagram. So I think what they're doing there is they're just basing it on half, and then they're going to multiply it later on by a factor of two um, to take um, into consideration um, the other half. So that would be down there, okay, on both sides. So for the bending moment, um, this is the bending moment and for the real, and this is the bending moment diagram of the virtual. And then these two are multiplied um, together, um, which you can see here. And we can see that this would have been using appendix um, two because that's a parabola and then that's a straight line. So this method here um, is using appendix two. Um, for the calculation, which would be this one here, this one here, so it would be using that method there. Um, calculate um, the integral is the area of this function here multiplied by that distance, which has been read off on that one there. Okay. So we then from here multiply by 2. Um, we get an equation for the deflection. So you can see you can work out the deflection um, pretty fast. Um, and you could, of course, have been using this one here instead. If you were using that, you might have decided to use that um, multiplied by that. Okay. So I know they're going in the wrong directions, but that's just something you've got to resolve for yourself and then um, you should be fine. So both, um, so hog, um, sagging multiplied by sagging is gonna end up with something positive. Then you can see the same thing is done for the shear. So again, this side and that. Um, so here again, multiplied by two because um, of the two sides by symmetry. And then you get an answer here, one over GA um, QL squared over eight in the calculation. Um, and then down here on the next page, we can see that the total deflection is due to the bending component plus the shear component. And then we can plot a graph um, or we can just investigate what happens as these um, ratios change. And then here we've got deflection due to shear, which would be this guy here, deflection due to shear. And then here deflection due to bending. Um, and we can see that as the sections become longer or as the H over L values become smaller and smaller, um, that um, the effect of the shear on the deflection is very small. But when you have something in the order of one over two, um, when the height is um, the height is half of the length. So in the one that I've drawn that, so that's the length if the height of the section had been maybe something like that, which is, which I think I've drawn it pretty well, um, height. Yeah, one over two. So that would be, that would be the height. Okay. And then that would be the length. So when the height is um, half the length, then the deflection due to shear divided by the deflection due to bending um, works out to be 0 0.6, which is pretty high, which means that you cannot ignore 
the deflection due to shear. All right. But for longer ones, when h over l is 1 over 30, um, maybe that case there, the height is 1 30th of the length, the deflection due to shear is 0.3% of the deflection due to bending. So um, I'd rather just, so I'm just trying to make the point here um, when deflection due to shear becomes important and how to calculate the deflection due to shear. And I can't think of any other method other than using virtual work to calculate the deflection due to shear. Um, the engineer engineer's theory of bending that Quincy would have covered and the slope deflection method, they all ignore shear deformations. And we assume plane sections remain plane and plane sections remain plane means um, no shear, um, shear is ignored. Right? So I think this is quite an important lesson. And this tells you how to calculate deflections due to shear um, if it's appropriate. So um, there's a there's a YouTube video, and there's also uh, um, there's a YouTube video on this, and there's also Catherine's recording. So um, the next example um, to look into would be this one here on calculate the horizontal deflection at the support D. Um, all members have flexural stiffness. Um, so I've again got another model. Um, so here we've got down here we've got a UDL acting here and this thing of course is going to want to move out so I don't think I want to do this calculation today I'll, um, I'll wait until we get to the um, lecture theatre next week um, so um, just a few things um, if you've got any questions if you want a zoom session with me um, if you want to meet me in the lab or meet one of the tutors in the lab, um, just flick us an email. You may not feel it's needed, in which case um, there's no need to. But if you wanted to, um, we're available um, to help. Um, if you've got any questions, um, just stick it up on Piazza. Um, and I'll try and get those questions answered in a reasonably short time. Um, a few other things. Um, all of the recordings that I've done um, since we finished the slope deflection method, they are all on the YouTube channel. So all of the lecture recordings um, are on the YouTube channel and all of the YouTube and all of the um, lecture recordings um, starting from buckling going up to here are also on the Dropbox. So you can get the you can get the full versions on the Dropbox. If you watch it off Canvas, unfortunately Canvas has some compression, um, so um, it, it can be a bit um, tough to read. But of course, if it's tough to read, you always have the course book, and I hope my handwriting's not been too bad. So um, look forward to seeing you next week. Um, and um, if you've got any questions in the meantime, um, just contact me. Um, if you did want a three D printed model to bring to your exam. Um, they're available for collection at the Outwards Goods um, in the city campus. Okay. So um, hopefully um, see you all on Monday.